Hi everyone, my name is Dr Matt Williams. I'm a tutor in politics and what is known as the Access Fellow here at Jesus College at the University of Oxford. Today I'm going to give you a taste of lecture. So the sort of way that we often teach at the University of Oxford is with lectures where we will pose difficult questions and fundamentally we will just be encouraging you to think. So these are not opportunities for us to unload loads of information, although there will be a fair amount of information. The primary goal is for you to come at, out at the end of the lecture puzzling things and trying to work out a solution of your own. That's my ultimate ambition. And today we're going to be doing a mad old romp through human progress, okay? In order to understand what progress could mean, whether we've achieved any progress, and if we have progressed, where did we progress from? Okay, so a good place to start with any question like this is with the language of the question. And we can get warmed up with a past Oxford interview question which goes as follows. What is humanity's greatest achievement? Right, what is humanity's greatest achievement? Okay, so track what your mind is doing. Where's your head at at the moment? Because quite commonly, people will lurch to certain instantaneous conclusions on this along the lines of, well, landing on the moon, for example. It's a perfectly valid example. But in an Oxford interview setting, we would be encouraging you to explain, given the wording of the question, why you reached that conclusion. So how does landing on the moon describe a human achievement? And why do you think that's the greatest? And what do you think greatest even means? So we would help you to think about your thinking, try and work out why you've gone for that particular conclusion. It's common that people would say the moon landing because that idea perhaps has been implanted in their minds as an astonishing example of human achievement. Indeed, Neil Armstrong even invoked the idea of progress when he said, I've taken a small step for man and a giant leap for mankind. The, the word progress from Latin literally meant walk forward. So there are lots of metaphors in this space around walking, climbing, leading, going forward, right? moving. But that begs all sorts of interesting questions. First of all, is why did you move? What was behind you? Why did you feel that you had to move somewhere? Why did human beings in various sort of epochal moments of their development decide, we're gonna move? Did they have to move? Or was this just through some sort of ideal, idealistic desire to improve? Why do humans ever take these proverbial or even literal steps forward? Is what I'm interested in with progress. Now going back to the interview question, one of the most creative answers I ever heard to this was rubbish, trash, is humanity's greatest achievement. And the student justified their answer by saying the word greatest doesn't need to mean the best, the most sort of morally superior, it could just mean the biggest. <laughs> and in terms of something that humans have done more than anything else, producing rubbish is definitely up there as one of the things they've done the most of. You know, there is an island of trash in the Pacific Ocean that is the size of the USA, for example. So in terms of what we've done that's the greatest, you could have some fun with the language there and play around with it. And that is definitely your prerogative in an interview setting in Oxford. You would need to explain how and why you're using words in a certain way, but don't feel that you have to use them in any particular sort of predictable or predefined way. You can be relatively creative. And so that's why that's quite an interesting answer to that. But more generally, you know, we talk about progress as leaps, steps. Sometimes we might use the metaphor of the cutting edge, which is a metaphor derived from agriculture, the cutting edge of a plough specifically. But of course, in more common parlance, we tend to talk about progress in, in, in the metaphor of steps. So I'm going to be using steps as a visual metaphor here by looking at the various stages of human evolution and development. Not evolution, literally. Technological, idealistic, that sort of evolution. You know, changes in the way we live our lives, how we live our lives, and basically trying to unearth what were we doing? Why were we doing that? What's the motivation? So we should probably start in the beginning and work out where we've taken these steps from. So if we've been progressing, where is the regress? Where is the step behind us? What, what is the sort of the, the state of nature for human beings? Well, there are two people who are most closely associated with the idea of a state of nature and an original human condition. One of whom is this man, Thomas Hobbes, and the other one is this man, Jean-Jacques Rousseau. They're both writing at a similar time in the 17th century, and both 
inspired or instigated their writings on account of the, the new world being discovered and Native Americans in particular first coming into contact with Europeans. And the Europeans felt that they had discovered original humans, that they were sort of humans that had not civilized as far as they saw it, and therefore were a glimpse into our shared past. And so they thought that they were looking back in time, if you like, towards a sort of a pre-progress human being. Now they made various sort of quite clear mistakes in their evaluation of early human beings. For a start, they sort of assumed that these humans lived in a state of nature, as they would describe it. But actually, the Native Americans lived in all sorts of very different states, and summarizing them and categorizing them so simplistically and reductively as all being uncivilized, barbaric, living in a state of nature, was incredibly misleading. Indeed, the only thing they had in common was being technologically behind Europeans. But it wasn't even clear what behind meant. I mean, these people didn't have guns, but did that mean that they were backward? This is the problem, right, of the concept of progress, is it is too metaphorical. It is too sort of indicative of steps forward versus steps backwards. And it gives us an impression that humans might be on a journey, on a path towards some sort of particular point of enlightenment and away from a particular point of incivility or barbarity. But both of these sorts of destinations are utterly indeterminate and entirely dependent on the person whose perspective is, is leading this analysis. In other words, you know, for Hobbes in particular, he thought that the state of nature was, in his words, nasty, brutish and short. It was just horrifying and you would want to get out of it as quickly as possible. So he definitely saw human beings without modern technology as barbaric and dangerous. Rousseau, interestingly, had a different mindset. He felt that hum humanity had fallen since civilization, that actually the state of nature was a time of noble savagery, to use that awful turn of phrase, that human beings had sullied themselves by taking part in civilization and that they had been purer, they had been freer, when they did not engage in the development of technologies such as guns. So they have a very different mindset on pre-civilization human beings. Both of, both of them were basically mistaken, as I mentioned, about the, the very concept of a state of nature, but they were both aware of that. They were both conscious that what they were engaging with was what's called a thought experiment. So they were just hypothesizing what if there was a state of nature, what would it look like, how would it explain human behavior? Actually, what we've found in anthropological research is really interesting about this, this state of nature, this sort of pre-civilization pre age for human beings. This is an example of Neolithic remains of an individual called Romito II. And these remains were discovered in France, about 10,000 years old. And what they show is an, an adult man who lived to a, a good age for someone at that time but had been born with a genetic disorder that had stunted his growth quite significantly and would have meant very painful walking. And so effectively, this is a disabled man who lived well into adulthood. He was buried with ornaments and his was clearly a celebrated life. What's interesting about Romito too is that it sort of smashes apart any sense that human kindness is itself a product of a more privileged, technological, progressed, quote-unquote, age. That actually human beings have always been capable of kindness and empathy and caring for the vulnerable and the weak. And that it's a sort of uh, a pro self-propagating narrative that we keep saying, oh, well, we can only do this because of civilization. But actually, it could be that civilization has made us worse. I mean, one way in which civilization perhaps has made us worse, although the word worse isn't very clear either, is our brain size. Our brain sizes since Neolithic humans have shrunk by about the scale of a tennis ball. Now, it's not clear whether this shrinking is a bit like your phone shrinking and becoming more powerful at the same time because it's more efficient, or whether it's shrinking because we're just a bit thicker <laughs> than, uh, than our Neolithic cave people ancestors. 
that's just not clear. But these sort of supposedly brutal barbarians that are our uh, antecedents had bigger brains than we do, is the, is the long and short of it. <laughs> and it could be because we've become so used to relying ourselves on technology to resolve problems of the mind that actually our mind has become less capable. Just as how our skeletons will have become weaker from us doing less active work. So it is quite possible that we are less intellectually capable as a consequence of things like writing and civilization. So that's worth thinking about. Again, when we talk about progress and whether or not we have attained anything as a species, not to be sort of too quick to assume that progress is always to a certain place and is always, you know, unambiguously good in moral terms. We've got to be a bit more sort of nuanced and sophisticated in our analysis. Anyway, where should we go next on our story of human progress? Well, from sort of the state of nature, quote unquote, to the Stone Age and to some of the earliest innovations, if you like, that are crucial to the human story, such as agriculture, the, the harnessing of produce in order to yield surpluses. So certain grains like wheat and rice were propagated in Europe and Asia, and then it was yams in Africa. And interestingly, this sort of agricultural revolution seemed to happen at roughly the same time at various different points in the world where human beings carried on to a certain extent hunting and gathering, but also looked at just staying in a certain place and developing an, an agriculture within that area so that they didn't have to keep moving around. They didn't have to be quite so peripatetic. Now, what's intriguing about that is the, just the simultaneity of it, that it was all happening at around the same time, which suggests that it may have something to do with climate change. And it specifically, the Ice Age might have encouraged humans not to be constantly sort of hunting and gathering, but try and stay in a particular place. At a similar time, you get animal husbandry. And animal husbandry is really fascinating because of the sorts of animals that were simply available. You know, some parts of the world were just luckier than others. I mean, what, for example, is the difference between a horse and a zebra, apart from the obvious that zebras look different? As an aside, are zebras black with white stripes or white with black stripes? They're black with white stripes. <laughs> the difference is that horses can be domesticated and zebras cannot. You may be able to tame an individual zebra, but the great advantage with horses is that if you tame one horse, you get more for the for the price if you like it's a bit like when if you try and tame wolves if you find the alpha wolf the rest of the pack will come with you because you're the new alpha wolf horses do something relatively similar whereas zebras do not so what that meant is that asian and european communities that had horses wild horses were able to domesticate them and could therefore have animals that were able to pull plows and lead cavalry charges into war the uh, peoples in Africa who had zebras were not so lucky. And indeed, Africa has no native species of animal that can be domesticated on, on the sort of scale that you know, other farmyard animals were domesticated in Eurasia. So things like sheep and pigs and chickens and cows and horses are all in Europe and Asia. But in Africa, they've got you know, lions and crocodiles and hippos and, you know, just scary stuff that will tear your face off. Uh, the Americas were similarly unlucky with their domesticatable, that's a word, it's not a word, uh, animals. Things like uh, llamas and alpacas, you can kind of, you know, get wool from them, but they're not going to pull a plow for you. And a bison will more likely rip your face off than, than drag something around a farmyard. <laughs> so, you know, the Americans were similarly unlucky, if that's the word, in the sense of the the animals that they had available to exploit and to generate even bigger surpluses and to develop the capacity to go to war. But nonetheless, another innovation that we find of absolute critical importance in the Stone Age are needles. Uh, these are bone needles uh, held currently in the British Museum in London. The reason that these are so important is because they allow human beings to sew figure-hugging clothes, which allows them to exploit more climate-unfriendly environments. If you think about the uh, exploration and discovery of America, for example, 
the original humans to discover America would have had to walk across the, the northern Pacific whilst it was frozen in an ice age. Now, to achieve that, they would have had to have figure-hugging clothes, and so they must have sewn some of their own clothing. But bear in mind, they didn't have, you know, sophisticated modern clothing or GPS or even any knowledge of where they were going. They didn't know they were about to discover America. They just kept walking because of their insane determination and curiosity and, I suppose, desperation that they just couldn't go backwards. And this is a sort of a literal sense of how walking forwards can sometimes be to avoid disaster. And I suspect a lot of these points of progress that human beings have made have been to avoid disaster. So we take a step forward because the ledge behind us is crumbling, right? So all of these things that we talk of and congratulate human beings for achieving and aspiring to and leading to could in all likelihood just be examples of humans in the very nick of time avoiding catastrophe, which is, you know, also something to be celebrated, but perhaps gives a different spin on the notion of progress. All right? And of course, all of these various things that humans progressed to in the Stone Age led to slavery, war, and disease. You know, animals bring with them diseases, zoonotic diseases, as they're called. And in order to uh, maintain higher population densities within certain areas, you're bound to have war, you're bound to increase the need for, or the perceived need for human slavery in order to exploit even more resources. So a lot of these things that we think of as progressive have a darker side to them as well. So progressing, if you'll excuse the pun, to the next stage of human development, which is the earliest history. Now history is defined as just recorded past. So that's the, the technical definition. So once people have, have something that you can count as a record, then that is technically history. And so, of course, perhaps the most obvious candidate for progress in this epoch is writing itself, actually the capacity to produce a record. And writing is just an astonishing achievement, so important to our story, because indeed, how could we even have recorded many of our stories across generations without writing? Of course, there was the oral tradition of the likes of Homer, um, but you know, definitely not exclusive to the Greek world. But writing sort of allows hugely, vastly multi-generational communication of ideas. It's probably you know, easily one of the most important human achievements. But why was it done? This is another sort of instance where you've got to think, Ooh, this is a crazy step forward. Why did it happen? Well, here on the screen is an example of proto-cuneiform, which was developed in the Sumerian Empire, which is in modern-day Iraq, one of the earliest points of civilization on Earth. And some of the earliest recorded documents are, we think, uh, tax related. <laughs> so they were to record tax receipts and um, payment. So it's kind of depressing for the origin of something as important as writing. Although it's worth noting that one of the oldest pieces of writing that we have available to us is the, called the Tale of Gilgamesh, which is a superhero story. So there we go, humans invent writing and they come up with a tax account and a superhero story, which sounds you know, incredibly similar to modern human beings. <laughs> you know, we, we invest our time in bureaucracy uh, and play. And I mean, superhero stories can be pretty serious and the Tale of Gilgamesh was certainly serious, but it's interesting how sort of similar we are <laughs> to our, our predecessors. Anyway, you know, why do this? Well, I mean, part of the rationale is just to, to bureaucratize, to make a state function more efficiently. Because if you've got more people and you've got uh, resources that you need to manage carefully and you've got competitors, then you need to get yourself organized. And bureaucracy is a fundamental part of that. And writing and keeping records and administration is therefore a necessity. It's not necessarily just a, a luxury. It is something that is needed. Now, another sort of related triumph of early history is mathematics. Now, you could say mathematics is either created or discovered, but for this guy, Pythagoras, it was a religion, a, a literal religion. He went to the pyramids in Egypt with his followers, and they, they worshipped the trigonometry that they were able to perform in order to work out the height of the pyramids. Not sure I've ever been quite so devoted to mathematics personally, but I'm loving the, the enthusiasm for it. But maths, you know, to my mind is a bit like other forms of writing. It's a symbolic language that represents reality. And in that sense, it's wildly powerful and capable of helping us communicate 
about things that we can and cannot see. So I think it's similar to writing in the sense that, that its capacity is to help us communicate complex ideas in relatively simple ways. And so this enables much more complex societies to develop on the back of very sophisticated bureaucracies. Now this image is from much later in Imperial China, but China is rightly credited as one of the founding places of contemporary bureaucracy, this idea of keeping very careful records and working out what is going on and taking as much information and data as possible in order to analyze the behavior of human beings. So these are very sort of important steps forward to continue using that metaphor of progress. But states make war, right? Um, uh, one of the rationales for bureaucratizing is to know where the resources are so that when the enemies come, you can kill them better. So whether or not that is an advance is controversial, difficult to ascertain. Anyway, moving to ancient history, what are some of the important points to highlight here? Well, one of them's got to be metallurgy, fairly sort of well-trodden story about the move from bronze to iron in the Iron Age. Indeed, intriguingly, it took human beings longer to progress from bronze swords to iron swords than it did then take human beings to progress from iron swords to nuclear weapons, which is surprising and shocking. But obviously, the, it's not that ferrous materials weren't known to humans before the Iron Age, but they just they couldn't exploit them. They couldn't create forges that were hot enough to exploit those sorts of materials. So I suppose what we're really talking about in the Iron Age is not so much that the discovery of iron and its properties, but the ability to actually conquer iron as a material, to use it and to exploit it to its fullest extent. Another thing that's worth noting in ancient history is applied mathematics. So it's all very well Pythagoras going and having a good old worship at the pyramids about trigonometry. But um, what this bridge in France, the Pont du Gard, describes is what you can be done with mathematics. This is an astonishing example of civil engineering which still could work thousands of years after it was put up. It not only shows the exquisite mathematics involved in constructing such a bridge, but also the materials such as concrete that were also developed by the Romans. It's an absolutely astounding achievement. And then there's monotheism. Now why would I describe monotheism as part of the human progress story? Well, I mean, it, it's crucial to billions of people around the world is one fairly obvious point. But then also monotheism sort of clarified disputes that had previously existed in polytheistic faiths. And so some of the noise, if you like, amongst a variety of different religious traditions were quietened down quite significantly by monotheism spreading. But again, you know, whether or not that's a step forward or that's a progress depends almost entirely on the individual who's assessing it. And this, again, proves that this notion of progress is wildly subjective and potentially problematic as a result. But you must decide. Okay, so what about the so-called Dark Ages? Well, the Dark Ages were described by, by Plutarch as being dark basically because of the fall of the Western Roman Empire. But it's worth noting that the Eastern Roman Empire was doing pretty well, thanks very much, under this guy in particular, Justinian, the Emperor Justinian, who produced famous code of laws, which it actually forms the basis of much European law, so-called Roman law, uh, much of it derives from Justinian's code. So it wasn't a particularly dark time in the East. I mean, it was quite dark in the sense that Western and Northern Europe wasn't achieving very much. But again, that sort of concept that, you know, a, a time is dark because humans aren't progressing. Well, we've got to ask, well, why weren't they progressing? And does it actually matter? You know, does it make it lesser of a human if you're not moving forward? What if you're just celebrating your, uh, your achievements to that date? Why do you, what if you don't feel any compulsion to, to move forward, right? These are sort of conceptual questions which I think we often just forget when we talk about marching forward and progressing. Anyway, Justinian sort of describes that there was a lot going on in the Dark Ages. There was also, of course, uh, the, the Silk Road, which was at its zenith under, the, under this period. So the idea that, you know, fine, Europe might not be up to much, but that the rest of the world was just slumbering as well is utter nonsense. And perhaps this is most clearly described in the, in the Islamic world and the Arab world in particular, which was developing an extraordinary sort of culture, scientific capability, literature, during the time when Europe was, was keeping quiet. 
I mean, one interesting way in which this actually benefited Europe was that Arab scholars kept many of the writings of Socrates and Aristotle, which in Europe were left to degrade to such a poor state that they barely existed anymore. So a lot of the works that we have of the ancient Greek scholars came, came from Arabic, and they had to be translated back into Greek because Arab scholars had been much more assiduous at keeping those records. So there's a lot going on in the so-called Dark Ages. But again, to, to describe those ages as dark just because people aren't up to much <laughs> seems a little bit judgmental to me. Anyway, what about the late Middle Ages? Well, you know, I'm, I'm picking sort of fairly arbitrarily here, but my, my choices are the university. Uh, so my example here is the University of Bologna, which is the world's oldest continuously operating university. It's in northern Italy. It's the city which, amongst other things, gave us Bolognese sauce. Um, now, the university comes at a time when there's supposedly not much going on in the world again, as, and especially in Europe. But, you know, the university is something that I would personally credit, and you probably say I'm biased because I've been working in a university for my entire, entire adult life. So I'm definitely biased. But, you know, universities, this, this notion of bringing together teachers, I mean, that, that's where the, the word university comes from, is the, sort of the one, the, the collective, the cooperative, if you like, of lecturers brought together under a single jurisdiction. And this was because there was a lot of teaching going on. There was lots of people trying to learn. And churches in particular realized that if you brought those people together, you could potentially control them better and you could potentially tax them heavier. Uh, so that's one of the, sort of the early reasons for universities developing. Another sort of fairly obvious, unavoidable story to talk about is the Renaissance or the rebirth. But what I find particularly interesting about the Renaissance is that it literally means rebirth, and therefore it's describing the sense of, of rediscovering progress from the past, right? So in particular, Europeans were fond of recreating the classical world, so the, the Roman and ancient Greek worlds in particular. And so they felt that they weren't progressing, but regressing. They were going back, which is such an intriguing way of thinking about it. But in some ways they were unambiguously making technological steps forward in terms of the building materials, in terms of the capabilities of producing exquisite artworks. One of the reasons I'm showing this image is because of the, the frescoes painted by Giotto and in particular the use of the colour blue. So you can see the colour blue quite clearly on this night sky, this absolutely gorgeous night sky. Now why is the colour blue so interesting? Well the colour blue just wasn't available as as something that could be synthesized for the ancients. So the, the ancient Greeks, for example, it is thought didn't even have a word for blue. So if you've ever read the Iliad or the Odyssey, they describe the uh, rose-fingered dawn and the wine-dark seas. It never uses the word blue. And that's because you just can't easily make blue pigment out of anything natural. And so many people just never painted in blue. But in the Renaissance, thanks to the Silk Road, there was access to lapis lazuli from modern day Afghanistan. And that is a, a way that you can make a very good synthetic blue pigment. And so Europeans for the first time were able to paint in this absolutely gorgeous color. You may have seen sort of early or pre-Renaissance art describes skies with gold leaf rather than blue because they just literally didn't have any blue to use. So this is an unambiguous sort of improvement, but whether or not that's progress, well, that's up to you. Another sort of point of progress in this era is discovery. And so this man is Ferdinand Magellan, the first person to circumnavigate the globe. Incidentally, the second person to circumnavigate the globe was Francis Drake, notorious privateer, pirate, if you like, uh, of of Queen Elizabeth I. <laughs> anyway, you know, whether or not that is that sort of age of discovery is progress, again, is controversial because it brings with it conquest and empire and enslavement and disease and all sorts of other things. So again, for every step forward, we need to ask why step forward and what were the consequences and can we necessarily say this was all good? We just need to have a think about it, okay? Now, what about the modern period? Well, my, my options here are the Enlightenment, which I'm using, for which I'm describing with this coffee shop in Oxford. This is called the Queen's Lane Coffee Shop, which still exists and claims to have been in permanent existence since 1654, which would make it the oldest continuously operating coffee shop, at least in England, if not, it's thought, probably the world. 
The slight problem is that there's a coffee shop on the other side of the street which also claims to be the world's oldest coffee shop. <laughs> no one quite knows which is which. Anyway, there's been a coffee shop on this site continuously running for a very long time. Let's leave it at that. Why is coffee relevant to the Enlightenment? Well, in cities like Oxford, prior to the relative sort of accessibility of coffee, people would have to drink a lot of beer in order to stay hydrated. There was some water available, but none of it was particularly fresh and you could very quickly get a nasty disease like dysentery or typhus if you drank the water. So you would have to make sure that the water was purified and killed of all the nasty bugs. And one of the best ways of doing that was to ferment it and to create beer. But of course, people in other parts of the world had cleverly been boiling the water <laughs> to kill, it, kill all the bugs and producing things like tea. Uh, but tea was a long way from, uh, from England at this stage. So coffee suddenly blasted onto the scene in the mid 17th century. And so you have a lot of very clever people trying to work very hard, switching their drinking habits from, from alcohol, from beer to coffee. And I don't think coincidentally, there's a huge explosion in scientific work <laughs> in places like Oxford. So we shouldn't discount the fact that, you know, through new resources being exploited like coffee, there was a complete change in people's working habits. Anyway, um, another sort of related step forward, if you think it's a step forward, although I think this one's hard to deny the importance of, uh, was in microbiology and in recognizing how you could potentially protect someone from a virus. And this man is called Edward Jenner. And he noticed that people that worked commonly with cows uh, would not get smallpox because what would happen is that they would catch cowpox and then they would be, uh, they would be immune or at least they would be much less likely to catch such a, a ferocious bout of smallpox and smallpox was deadly at the time. And so what he recognized is that if you gave people cowpox, they would be immunized against smallpox. And so hence, that's exactly what he did. And so that's why we call vaccinations vaccinations because the word vacca is uh, Latin for cow or vache in French. And so vaccination is where it gets its name from. Now, of course, the importance of that in terms of human health is very difficult to exaggerate. So I'm not gonna make a claim of that's not progress. It's a pretty unambiguous one in that case. Um, and industrialization is another sort of crucial step forward. And industrialization is very much an example of a step forward taken in order to avoid disaster. So Thomas Malthus, who was a, an amateur statistician, had worked out that human populations were growing exponentially, but food supply was growing arithmetically. And he crunched the numbers and basically said, we're all going to die of starvation if we don't fix this. And what happened was industrialization. <laughs> so he didn't anticipate that. And the capacity to produce food at a much higher rate was achieved. But it's, industrialization is an example of a step forward taken in order, in part at least, to avoid disaster. So again, that gives that an interesting sort of steer on what progress even looks like. Okay, what about the 20th century? Well, my candidates here are the electronic computer, nuclear power, and human rights. So starting perhaps with the, the least controversial, <laughs> uh, the electronic computer. This is Colossus in Bletchley Park, the world's first fully functioning electronic computer. It was designed to crack the Enigma codes that were used by the Nazi government in order to communicate their messages. And it was overseen by Alan Turing, the, the godfather of modern computer science. I mean, it, I wouldn't be able to talk to you right now without this development. It's an absolutely astonishing achievement and you know, difficult to deny its importance. But again, this is an example where necessity was the mother of invention. In order to try and create enough compute to break the Nazi cipher, a Colossus was born. So again, this is progress, but you know, stepping away from disaster, if you like. Nuclear power you could decide, describe as in a similar terms, actually, in order to avoid an amphibious assault on Honshu, the, the, they uh, escalated plans of dropping nuclear weapons and producing nuclear power. Now, I appreciate that is very controversial. So that is a narrative, but you think of your own. This particular weapon is called Little Boy, which, which is a chilling name, and it's 
it was paired with Fat Man. Fat Man was the the heavier bomb dropped on Nagasaki, and Little Boy was the slightly lighter uranium bomb dropped on Hiroshima. Now this ushered in the nuclear age. Now why would I say that that was progressive? That, you know, as I say, is controversial. Well, nuclear power has very significant uh, capabilities, which can potentially help us in the green transition, albeit, you know, the waste product is not green. But also nuclear weapons have made conventional warfare much less likely. And so the number of people dying in wars has dropped very significantly since the end of the Second World War. Notwithstanding, there have been some appalling conflicts around the world. The actual numbers of people dying in wars fell off a cliff, proverbially, after the Second World War. So this is controversial, but that's what I want to talk about, right? I want us to think about those fuzzy cases at the margins where we want, might not be so keen to say, well, that was a step forward and actually interrogate those. So make up your own mind on that. And then lastly, perhaps slightly less controversial would be human rights. But again, this is an example where human beings came to the absolute brink of complete depravity during the Second World War on a number of different levels and afterwards created frameworks for avoiding such crimes happening again. So the sense of progress was not one of enlightened decision making, you know, improving our standing as a species. It was very much taking a step away from the utter horror and depravity of the preceding years. Anyway, those are my candidates for the 20th century. So what is next? Well, we've likely got artificial intelligence barreling down the track. We've got uh, quantum computing and maybe, hopefully, some action on climate change. But you let me know in the comments what you think the next steps will be and how those steps will be taken and why those steps might be taken. But, you know, again, more generally, I want you to think quite critically and quite creatively about what progress even means and whether humans have made any progress and why we've made any progress. So here's an interesting quote uh, from Lucan. Why, ruler of Olympus, hast thou uh, to anxious mortals thought fit to add this care that they should know by omens future slaughter? Let whatever thou art preparing be sudden, let the mind of men be blind to fate in store, let it be permitted to the timid to hope. Now, what this is on about is basically how are we so aware of the future? How are we able to anticipate disasters that might befall us? It's an intriguing feature of the human mind, and some would describe it as a curse, that we are cursed to be aware of our own mortality and our own fragility. But it's a curse that we often use in order to shape narratives about human beings and the human condition and notions of human progress. And so it's something that inevitably leads us to this sort of storytelling about where we've moved to and where we have moved from. But that sort of metaphorical language of taking steps forward can be overly simplifying at best. And at worst, it could be just completely misrepresentative. So be very careful when you're talking about progress, regress, transgressing, and how you're actually using those words, because at root, they are metaphorical. And we need to be careful with any use of metaphor. We need to try and be as literal as possible when we are being academic and we're trying to analyze a phenomenon as plainly as we can. Anyway, I'd love to know your thoughts on anything that's been raised, so do drop them in the comments below, and otherwise I look forward to seeing you next time. Thanks so much for watching. Bye now.